Okay guys, this is the big one. Stanley Kubrick. He made some pretty good movies, didn't he? In fact, after some research, it turns out that he's considered by many to be the greatest, most important, and most influential filmmaker of all time. Crazy, I know. A fun game I like to play is to think of a genre, then think of some of the best films from that genre, and usually you end up realizing that at least one of them was made by Stanley Kubrick. Whether it's drama, or comedy, or war, or sci-fi, or horror, it just seemed like everything he touched, especially in the second half of his career, turned to gold. Yet despite Kubrick's filmography being so varied, pretty much every single one of his movies were able to achieve the very same idiosyncratic, unique, and kind of incredible tone. And I'm not sure it's something I could really describe fully. Like, sure, I could talk about the surreal detachment all his films seem to have, their dark humour, their icy rigid camera movement, their meticulous attention to detail, particularly with the framing, their extensive set design, all of the extreme wide-angle lenses, the way each of his later films seemed to push the cinematic medium in ways it had never gone before. I could talk about all the contributing factors to Kubrick's genius for days on end, but when it really comes down to it, the only way one can really appreciate the man is to watch all 13 of his feature films. So that's what I did in this week's edition of Worst to Best. I don't know why I said this week's edition. These things take way longer <laughs> than a week to make. <laughs> uh. Just a warning, there's gonna be lots of superlatives in this video. The phrase best blank of all time will probably be thrown around quite a lot. Even more than the Paul Thomas Anderson worst to best I did. But you know, when you're dealing with Stanley Kubrick, that is the reality of things. He really was just that incredible of a filmmaker. Anyway, let's just get into it. Oh, and remember kids, It's kind of surreal watching Fear and Desire, Kubrick's first ever feature film, knowing the director he would eventually become. See, I feel like there's three types of directorial debuts. The most common is what I would call the sneak preview. Films which hint at a director's talent and style and idiosyncrasies, while still being bogged down by the typical flaws of a filmmaking debut. A few examples being Bottle Rocket, As Tears Go By, Hard Eight, Bad Taste, and Who's That Knocking At My Door. These are all enjoyable watches, but it's clear they're made by filmmakers still trying to find their footing. Secondly, there's the very rare case of a director coming fully formed right out of the gate, and firing on all cylinders. This is your Citizen Kane, or Reservoir Dogs, or Get Out, or A Razorhead. It's pretty uncommon though. And then, finally, there's the film which doesn't really indicate at all that its director would come good, or in the case of Stanley Kubrick's Fear and Desire, that its director would go on to become one of the greatest and most important artists of the 21st century. Don't get me wrong, Fear and Desire is not like completely worthless. There are some nice compositions sprinkled throughout, Kubrick clearly had an eye for blocking and framing, even at 24 four years of age when he made this, but unfortunately Fear and Desire falls to the level of its lacklustre budget and dull screenplay. This is, at its core, an anti-war film. It's clearly trying to say something about the human condition or whatever, but both the war and the characters fighting in it feel far too vague and undefined to really get you thinking about anything, other than the handful of films Kubrick would go on to make later down the line which absolutely nailed the anti-war message in ways Fear and Desire could never even dream of. I mean, even Kubrick himself apparently renounced the film soon after it was released, saying he considered it like a child's drawing on a fridge, which is a pretty harsh burn, even by my standards. The man even, according to legend, tried to have all negatives of the film destroyed, but thank god he didn't, because if this film does one thing, it shows how failure can lead to greatness. It's actually quite inspiring to know that the guy who made this would later on in his career be accused of faking the moon landings, but unless you're a completionist, unless you really want to see where Kubrick started, I would say you can go ahead and skip this one. You, uh, you have my permission.
Killer's Kiss, Kubrick's second film, is an obvious step up from Fear and Desire. His shots are becoming more dense and mature, his camera movement more fluid and purposeful, the cinematography especially popping in the ballet and boxing sequences. I mean, make no mistake, this is no raging bull. It still feels kind of amateurish and stale. The screenplay and characters are only a little less bland than his previous work. The romance is dull and devoid of any excitement, and there is still absolutely no sign of the interrogating tone or dark humour Kubrick's later films would pull off so masterfully. But you know, Killer's Kiss, it's a completely serviceable noir, especially when considering it was made for only $75,000. A far, far cry from basically everything Stanley would make after this, but definitely an important stepping stone in his career, as it does feel like an actual movie. Anyway, that's basically it for Kubrick's first two films. Nothing to write home about, really, but I'd say from here on out it gets a lot better, so let's get into it. So, Lolita was one of the few films I had never seen before this watch through of Kubrick's filmography, and I feel like there's a few reasons as to why this is. See, I get the impression that Lolita is one of the more forgotten about Kubrick movies, and I think this is mainly because the first four films Stanley made are all steps up from the previous one. Killer's Kiss is a big improvement from Fear and Desire, The Killing is a big improvement from Killer's Kiss, and Paths of Glory is obviously a huge improvement from The Killing. Then of course Kubrick made made Spartacus, but this was more of a for-hire gig. The guy's artistic freedom and creative control were incredibly limited, due to the movie being a largely studio-driven production. So eventually, due to his experience with Spartacus, his growing dislike for the film industry in Hollywood, and his desire to go back to more personal projects, Kubrick moved to England, where he would live for the rest of his life. This move permitted him basically complete creative control while still retaining that crucial Hollywood financial backing. And looking back on this, I can imagine there was quite a rumble in the early 60s when this happened. What was Kubrick's next movie gonna be? You know, this incredibly exciting director, free from restraints, complete artistic freedom, what is he gonna make next? Oh, it's a film about a hebophile. And the thing is, Lolita is not even a bad movie, but you have to admit, it's kind of ironic that right after moving to England so he could have complete creative control over all his films, Kubrick decided to adapt Vladimir Nabokov's famously unfilmable novel about a man who falls in love with a 12 year old. I mean, the guy had balls, you have to give him that. It's definitely a bold genre departure, something Kubrick would pull off time and time again throughout his career with frightening competence. But remember, this is 1962. Of course you're gonna face significant challenges due to the censorship constraints of the time. Of course you're not gonna be able to make the film you truly want to make, which is the reason Kubrick left Hollywood in the first place. Stanley even said years after the release of Lolita that he's not sure he would have made the movie if he had fully understood just how strict the censorship limitations would be. So what we get in the end is basically just a watered down version of Nabokov's novel, which I believe I'm right in saying was mainly applauded for its beautiful writing and prose. Obviously not something which can really be translated to film anyway, as they're just such different storytelling mediums. Don't get me wrong, it's certainly an interesting story. Obviously the subject matter is taboo, it's gonna grab your attention, it's gonna raise an eyebrow, and to be fair to Kubrick, I think he adapts it as well as he could have. This is his sixth film, remember. By this point the guy really knows what he's doing behind the camera. We also get some pretty excellent performances here, and considering what the whole movie is about, it's weirdly funny. The scenes between James Mason and Shelley Winters in this comical one-sided relationship are pretty humorous. But yeah, overall, Lolita is kind of forgettable and insignificant when you look at Kubrick's career and filmography as a whole. Don't get me wrong, definitely an interesting watch. I would recommend giving it a go if you haven't seen it, but if we're being honest, I can't see myself revisiting it anytime soon. The Killing was Stanley Kubrick's first good movie. I personally wouldn't categorize it as an all-time classic, I wouldn't put it in the same bracket as the full-blown masterpieces Kubrick would go on to make a little later on in his career, but at the end of the day, this is a pretty fun and exciting noir, which simultaneously foreshadows Kubrick's trajectory towards more ambitious and philosophically rich pieces of work. Similar to stuff like The Shining and 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Killing is one of those films which is always rising, you know, it's always 
building momentum, never really stopping once it gets going. What begins here, in my opinion, as a pretty slow puzzle piece, tracking multiple characters and giving us a glimpse into each of their lives, slowly but surely grows into a pretty interesting and tense heist film. It is truly a testament to Kubrick's versatility, you know, the way he could seemingly take on any genre and churn out a classic. For example, one of the most notable elements of the killing is its narrative structure, a non-linear approach that presents the heist from multiple perspectives, opening on the horse race which the entire job kind of revolves around, before essentially going back and forth in time, following each of the criminals, giving us a peek into each of their home lives, motivations, and roles in the heist itself. It's very reminiscent of something like Reservoir Dogs. In fact, Tarantino has gone on record naming The Killing as his favourite heist movie of all time, and there's no doubt in my mind that it was a huge inspiration for the guy when making his debut. This non-linear technique, while not as refined as Kubrick's later explorations of time and perspective, offers a glimpse into the director's early experimentation and willingness to challenge traditional stories storytelling conventions. Overall with The Killing, it's probably not one of those films you're going to revisit once a year like some of these other movies, but what it is is a solid, well-made 85-minute noir, and really feels like Kubrick beginning to find his footing, especially with that hilarious ending, which I won't spoil here, but let's just say it's very reminiscent of the sort of nihilistic dark humour Kubrick's films are known for. In fact, I almost want to say that the final few minutes of The Killing is where Stanley Kubrick really becomes the geniusly cynical director we all know him as today. Like with his first two films, yeah there are glimpses into his brilliance, but it's only with The Killing where the legend truly starts. This is where Kubrick really began to take the first few steps on his ascent to cinematic greatness. And guess what guys, it only gets better from here. So like I mentioned earlier, Spartacus was the only film Kubrick made in his career where he did not basically have complete artistic control. So how did this happen? Well, initially Western director Anthony Mann was chosen to helm Spartacus. However, he was removed from the production a week into filming over creative differences. Kirk Douglas, the film's star and producer, would later claim that Anthony Mann seemed kind of scared with the humongous scope of the picture, and having been so impressed with Stanley Kubrick while working on Paths of Glory, decided to hire the 30-year-old director for his historical epic. Kubrick, although initially hesitant to take on a project not conceived by him, accepted the challenge, marking a unique chapter in his career as he collaborated within the constraints of the Hollywood studio system. Now, because of all this, I was slightly trepidatious when it came down to actually watching this thing for the first time. See, my favourite thing about Stanley Kubrick is his incredibly recognisable and idiosyncratic visual style, something I feel like he could only execute properly when he had full creative control. So the idea of him doing a for hire gig didn't exactly excite me, it's probably why I'd never seen Spartacus before preparing for this video. However, I am also a big fan of epics, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, Ran, Bridge on the River Kwai, Seven Samurai, Lord of the Rings. I'm not someone who shies away from long run times and sprawling narratives. So how good actually is Spartacus? How does Kubrick's limited creative control translate to the actual movie itself? Well. I'll be honest, if I had sat down and watched Spartacus not knowing anything about it, I wouldn't have been able to tell you that it was directed by the same guy who made Full Metal Jacket. I just wouldn't. However, what I would have been able to predict is that it was clearly made by a director who absolutely knows what he is doing, because while Spartacus does feel like a for hire gig when compared to the rest of Kubrick's filmography, as a historical epic from the golden age of Hollywood, it's a pretty solid piece of work. Set against the backdrop of ancient Rome, the film follows the gladiator Spartacus as he escapes slavery and eventually leads a revolt against the oppressive Roman Republic. Now, that might seem like too gargantuan of a tale to fit into one movie, but you know what? Kubrick's fifth film just about gets away with it. Everything about this movie is just so grand and immense, whether that's the sets, or the performances, or the brilliant battle sequences, or the cinematography, or the musical score. It all actually manages to fit rather smoothly into the 197 minute runtime, you know? I do think it's paced pretty well. And of course, bonus points for the intermission, we love an intermission here on this channel. I guess my biggest flaw of the film is that I feel like the actual personality of Spartacus is somewhat lost 
in the sheer epicness of the movie. And you might say that this is just a side effect of historical epics. The genre does usually tend to focus on plot over character, but I don't know man. I thought many of the other characters in the film were pretty interesting. Crassus, Antoninus, Batiatus, Gracchus, they were all more compelling than Spartacus, and you know, he's the titular character. And apparently Kubrick himself complained about this, claiming that Spartacus was lacking in any flaws, that he was too perfect of a protagonist. And yeah, I do think that's maybe why he's not that interesting of a character, but you know, Kirk Douglas does play him well, and I guess he doesn't necessarily need to be this really complicated guy for the film to work, so fine. So while Spartacus doesn't exactly reach the legendary size and grandeur of something like Lawrence of Arabia, nor does it really feel like a Stanley Kubrick movie compared to the rest of his filmography, it is still a satisfying watch, as it's one of those movies which kind of just nails all the fundamentals. Like there's nothing about this film which isn't at least a 7 out of 10, and I particularly found the final 30 minutes to be really powerful. And while I would definitely recommend doing your own research on this, I'll just really quickly mention the writer of Spartacus, Dalton Trumbo, who had to actually write the screenplay under a pseudonym due to him being blacklisted from Hollywood at the time. It's all quite a long and complicated story which would probably require its own video, but basically many critics have suggested that the whole ordeal with Trumbo may have partially inspired his screenplay's portrayal of class solidarity, which definitely adds a whole nother meta layer to the movie. Anyway, I think that's gonna be it. While Spartacus may not bear the same stylistic fingerprint as Kubrick's other projects, it does remain a captivating and pretty interesting entry in the man's incredibly diverse filmography, and is yet another testament to his genius versatility. Okay, I think this is where we're getting into classic territory, and I get the impression if there's one placement in this video which is going to annoy people the most, it's this one. Let me preface, Paths of Glory, Kubrick's fourth feature film, was one of the only pieces of work of his I'd not seen before making this video. And I'll be honest, when it came to sitting down and finally watching this thing for the first time, my expectations were really high. See, I don't think this was even the case, say, five, ten years ago, but I get the impression that nowadays, Paths of Glory is seen as one of Stanley's best films. I think on Letterboxd it is his highest rated movie, and while I do think Paths of Glory is great, I don't think it's one of his very best like many other people seem to. See, Paths of Glory has far less style or flamboyance or personality than Kubrick's other anti-war films. Although to be fair to him, this was clearly an intentional decision, as while movies like Doctor Strangelove or Full Metal Jacket are attempting to relate the anti-war argument through the lens of comedy or satire, Paths of Glory drops all the fun and games and Trojan horses, and instead acts as essentially a tool to beat the audience over the head with, and I mean that as a compliment. This is an angry, bitter, confrontational, 90 minute manifesto, detailing in a very lucid, candid manner why war is terrible, why war should never happen. And let's face it, we've seen movies like this before. War being bad is not exactly the most controversial statement, it's not exactly the rarest message to ever have been communicated in a cinema before. Most films in the anti-war genre go down one of two roads, either presenting the audience with graphic, harrowing, realistic depictions of violence which hits you right in your gut, or they go for something a little more philosophical and nuanced. Paths of Glory, however, while definitely doing both of these things, sort of strikes out completely on its own, and does something with the genre I have personally never seen before, focusing instead on the injustice within the military hierarchy itself, delving into the absurdities and cruelty of the chain of command, showcasing and exposing a system that values pride and ambition over human lives. Paths of Glory is not just about the horrors of war on the battlefield, most of the scenes don't even take place in the trenches. You could almost call this thing a courtroom drama. It's about the grotesque decisions made by those who hold power, comfortably removed from the front lines, and Kubrick illustrates the disparity between the soldiers and their higher-ups in such brutal fashion, contrasting these beautifully shot, opulent palaces with the gritty, dirty reality of the trenches. Usually I like subtlety and nuance in my films. If you've watched any of my other videos, you know this. But with Paths of Glory, I do understand why it's presented in this way. Like I said, it's not trying to be clever or crafty or flashy, like many of Kubrick's other films. No. It's a cry for help. It's brutal and vitriolic and incredibly mature for someone who was only 28 when they made it. For me personally, I just do prefer Kubrick when he's having a bit more fun with things, when he's implementing a bit more of his trademark tone and dark humour. I feel like that's why I watch Kubrick, you know? 
but I can see why people think Paths of Glory is one of his best. It's definitely one of the most angry, cynical movies I think I've ever seen, while still having that Kubrick touch in terms of the brilliant cinematography, pacing, and pathos. And I'll also just quickly mention, while Stanley's films are usually praised for their more technical aspects and aren't necessarily known for their standout performances, I would feel wrong not giving Kirk Douglas a quick shout out here, who is brilliant throughout this film, but that's gonna be it. Overall, I think Paths of Glory is a really unique and powerful anti war film. I would definitely check it out if you haven't. I just personally connect to it a little less than some of Kubrick's more stylish movies. And uh, speaking of. And wouldn't you know, A Clockwork Orange, Stanley Kubrick's iconic, bold, controversial, ultra-violent, nihilistic, satirical, surreal, disturbing fever dream is next on our list. And yes, that was a lot of adjectives to use. I kind of sound like a thesaurus, but this next film really is a lot. Trust me, you're gonna need a thesaurus if you wanna talk about it properly. Preferably one in Nadzat. But enough of that, let's govern it about this Bazoomni film. I first watched A Clockwork Orange about four years ago, and I think it's fair to say that I did not like it at all. And it wasn't even necessarily because of the horrifying scenes of torture and sexual assault, which of course famously got the movie banned in countries across the world when it was first released. No, I just found it slightly disjointed, messy, overindulgent, and if we're being honest, kind of forgettable. I would be lying if I said I didn't immediately dispel A Clockwork Orange from my memory the second I finished it. So when it came to this rewatch of Kubrick's filmography, let's just say I was not looking forward to revisiting this movie. I was full on expecting to put it dead last. And while it would have definitely filled my controversial placement on every worst to best video quota, sitting nicely next to Magnolia and Kill Bill, I kind of found myself coming round to A Clockwork Orange on this rewatch. Don't get me wrong, I still don't think this is some flawless masterpiece or anything, which is why it's not higher up in this ranking. But nevertheless, I can definitely now say that I am a fan of this godforsaken movie, and I can also say for sure that it will never leave my memory again. Let's get the obvious stuff out of the way. Production design, costumes, cinematography, music, you can tell within two seconds that this is a Stanley Kubrick movie. The surreal feel of the entire film, Kubrick's vision for the near future dystopian English society, written about in Anthony Burgess's original novel, it's like a nightmare, it's horrifying. This is probably Kubrick's scariest piece of work after The Shining. I've always loved stories set in the quote-unquote near future. They usually have this sort of frightening balance between feeling otherworldly, but never completely detached from our own universe, you know? It's that unnerving, uncanny valley atmosphere, which A Clockwork Orange just absolutely nails. This is especially the case with the set design and props. Whether it's the bar with the woman-shaped milk dispensers, or the various houses Alex and his droogs break into, they're so devoid of any soul, so dehumanizing. They're there's so many scenes which I just want to constantly pause so I can look around at all the weird details and random things Kubrick has specifically placed into each corner of the frame, and the way he positions and moves the camera. It's just all so nosy and voyeuristic, like we're not really supposed to be watching it. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think this is something most of Kubrick's films have, but it's especially the case here. It really helps heighten the nightmarish, surreal vibe. So as far as the feel and tone of A Clockwork Orange goes, it is absolutely quintessential classic Stanley Kubrick. It's creepy and oppressive and incredibly iconic. As for the story, it's definitely as weird as everything else going on in the film, but it almost feels not as important as the world which surrounds it. I haven't read Burgess's book, so I don't know if this was intentional or not, but the arc which Alex goes through does sort of feel like it's playing second fiddle to everything else, which is, you know, fine. There are many films which do this which I love. I've always been a guy more interested in style and or character over plot, but A Clockwork Orange is clearly trying to do something with the story. It's clearly trying to say something about violence and society and politics, but I don't know, man. It was a bit lost on me, if I'm being honest. I guess I'll have to watch it again in the future, which <laughs> will be fun. Uh, I do now think this is a film I'm quite invested in, and I wouldn't be surprised if it actually climbed up my ranking even more on a rewatch. The only other criticism I have, other than, you know, this not being a movie you should watch with your parents, is that I feel like it lulls just a bit in the second act, especially during some of those prison scenes. I kind of felt myself losing interest, you know, being a bit bored, but it's not too big of a deal. Overall, I think the best way I can summarize A Clockwork Orange is that it's the kind of film where you just don't want to eat anything for a good few 
few hours after you watch it, you know? You kind of just feel so disgusting to even be a human being, to exist in the same world as something which feels so repugnant. It's like the cinematic equivalent of beans on toast. Like a plate of beans on toast, which has been left out too long, and it's gotten really stale, and then you're just like, forced to eat it really slowly. That's what this film <laughs> feels like. Right, so I guess the most obvious place to start when discussing Full Metal Jacket is its unique narrative structure, which not only is unlike any of Kubrick's other films, but if we're being honest, unlike any other war movie I think I've ever seen. See, there aren't many films which you can so easily just cut down the middle as Full Metal Jacket, which have such a jarring dichotomy between the first and second half. In fact, it's been said by many critics and audience members that it almost feels like you're watching two different movies. It's surely the film's biggest and most common criticism. And while I used to agree with this sentiment, believing Full Metal Jacket's two halves lacked the harmony and congruence that Kubrick was going for, something he pulls off so effortlessly in his other, almost episodic pieces of work. I now see that they share rather a great deal thematically with each other, and actually form a pretty impressive and complete final product. Therefore, what I think we should do is discuss both of these halves individually before going on to talking about their relationship with each other. So, the first 45 minutes of Full Metal Jacket follows a platoon of US Marines through their boot camp training, and is definitely the more memorable and iconic of the two halves. Similar to A Clockwork Orange, you can tell right away that this is a Stanley Kubrick movie. His stylistic directorial fingerprints cover every single frame of this first act. There is just something so dark and depraved and mentally draining about watching these new recruits being so systematically berated and dismantled by R. Lee Ermey, who gives easily one of the best performances in any of Kubrick's movies as the ruthless, disciplined, but also hilarious drill instructor, an occupation the actor actually held for 11 years during the real Vietnam War. Kubrick's direction has always been cold and unflinching, but I don't think his style has ever been more compatible to a narrative and to a location as the empty, soulless dormitory where the first half takes place. Like, <laughs> honestly, I have nightmares about this room, man. This entire sequence provides such an intense portrayal of military training, such a gripping exploration of dehumanization and psychological warfare. Like, for example, I love how the film opens on the recruits all getting haircuts, which is immediately followed by all of them being given their nicknames. You know, it's all about stripping away their sense of identity and preparing them for this alienating conveyor belt of death. And I must say, I I think Full Metal Jacket is definitely one of Kubrick's best films when it comes to character. Obviously I've already mentioned Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, but here we're also introduced to Private Pyle and Private Joker, who are eventually paired up. And it's funny because you sort of expect them to begin this really wholesome friendship, where Joker eventually motivates and whips Pyle into shape, like something in an officer and a gentleman. And then you imagine they'll go off into war together, and sure they'll see some death and bloodshed, but they will have learnt a valuable lesson about the human condition. Or or whatever. And then you remember you're watching a Stanley Kubrick film, and of course none of that is going to happen. The final scene of this first half is chilling to the bone. Kubrick loved shooting scenes in bathrooms, and I'd call this the best one he ever shot. Vincent D'Onofrio perfectly embodies just an utterly broken, tormented man. And the moment he shoots first Hartman and then himself, while not something I can probably show in this video, is just a haunting climax to the first 45 minutes of this film, which I can safely say, in a vacuum, is a masterpiece in its own right. I'm not the first person to say that. But what I think is actually one of the most interesting things about this first half of Full Metal Jacket is that once we get to the second half, Private Pyle and the tragedy which took place are never mentioned again. And I've read some interpretations online of why this is. Some people claim that Pyle was not actually a real person, but instead a representation of all the recruits in a child, given the fact he needs help getting dressed, doesn't know his left from his right, and then there's also this scene. And sure, I can definitely see that, but I also like the idea that it just wasn't that big of a deal to ever bring up again, you know? Pyle's breakdown and eventual murder-suicide being just a byproduct of the dehumanizing military training, like some unavoidable workplace risk. So when we get into the second half of Full Metal Jacket, which by the way begins with one of my favorite transitions in the history of cinema, both from an audio and a visual perspective, there's this dangling lack of resolution, this eerie elephant in the room which is hiding just out of frame. In this 
second half, we follow Private Joker, who I think is pound for pound Kubrick's most human, three-dimensional character. I mean, maybe Bill and Alice from Eyes Wide Shut would have something to say about that, but Joker is definitely right up there. And I find the way the Vietnam War is actually portrayed here incredibly interesting and different to most other movies, you know? Make no mistake, there is no fortunate son played here, nor do any scenes take place in the jungle, which is actually kind of crazy if you think about every other Vietnam War movie ever. Anyway, Kubrick instead chose the cities of Da Nang and Hue, which I think perfectly fits with his decision to really display the monotony of war in this second act. It all feels so numb when compared to the emotionally draining climate climax of the film's first half. You know, it's said in 1968, a point in time where opinions on the Vietnam War back in America had really began to sour. There's this sense of emptiness within the soldiers who have just become so used to the bloodshed, which I think is juxtaposed really well with Private Joker, who is attempting throughout the film to hold on to his humanity and sense of humour. This second half is definitely less memorable than the first. While there are still some brilliant moments of satire and tension throughout, two things we know Kubrick is brilliant at. There is less to discuss. It's all quite monotonous and aloof, but I think this is the point of the movie. Because at the beginning of Full Metal Jacket, we're so invested into the recruits, especially Joker and Pyle. You know, we really want them to succeed, but I feel like this is Kubrick basically lulling the audience into a false sense of hope and meaning. Similar to the people in real life who wanted to fight in the Vietnam War thinking it would be this really patriotic and virtuous thing. So when we witness Pyle failing, when we laugh at Gunnery Sergeant Hartman's Terence Fletcher level insults, and when we inevitably are left in shock by Pyle's murder-suicide, it's like this roller coaster of guilt, it's this tidal wave of emotions. Therefore, when we eventually go to Vietnam in the film's second half, we are just as numb and apathetic as the characters on the screen. So yes, Full Metal Jacket is a top-heavy movie, and I can understand why people are sometimes left disappointed once the film leaves the boot camp stuff behind. But there is my argument as to why it was all intentional, and that's why, in my opinion, the film's two halves actually combine rather nicely to create an even stronger whole. Anyway, thank you for coming to my TED talk, let's move on. Stanley Kubrick dipped into the anti-war genre many times during his career, but Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, is in my opinion the best of the lot, proving that the most effective way to discuss and dissect such serious, weighty subjects as war is often through the lens of satire. Now, I'm gonna quickly talk about the comedy of Stanley Kubrick's movies as a whole, as I think it's pretty important to keep in mind when dissecting his filmography, especially Dr. Strangelove. So, the majority of Kubrick's films films are pretty funny, you know, most of them have this humorous undercurrent. For me, it's actually one of Kubrick's standout directorial trademarks. Even with something as frightening as The Shining, or as disturbing as A Clockwork Orange, or as elegantly buttoned up as Barry Lyndon, they all contain this subtle layer of I almost want to say whimsy? I don't know. It's one of those things which is hard to put into words. You kind of have to watch a few of his films to really understand what I'm talking about. And I think depending on who you ask, Kubrick's humour is either pretty blatant or incredibly subtle, because his films aren't funny in the typical way that movies are funny. It's not like the characters are really cracking jokes or anything. No. Like most things with Stanley, it's all in the subtext. It's that kind of bizarre feeling of watching a scene or a performance which feels so specifically unusual or silly or over the top, and you're just sat there asking yourself, is this supposed to be funny? Because I'm pretty amused right now, but I'm not sure if I should be. I don't really know if this was the filmmaker's intention. To me, it's one of the best feelings that art can evoke. It's that ambiguous humour, where you want to laugh but you don't feel like you've been given sufficient permission to by the creator. I think this is why when I was younger and I was first getting into Kubrick, the humour kind of completely flew right over my head, and this was no more true than with Doctor Strangelove, a film which I liked the first time I watched it, you know, I appreciated it for its technical merit and what it was trying to say, but I don't really remember laughing at all. And if we're being honest, I do just think I might have been a little too young at the time to really understand Kubrick's brand of comedy. Like, for example, <laughs> around the same time I first watched Doctor Strangelove, I also saw the 2002 French mockumentary Dark Side of the Moon, which, if you didn't know, is a spoof on Apollo 11 moon landing conspiracy films, but which I fully thought was a serious documentary the entire time. And it was only after I finished the film and went onto its Wikipedia page that I realized 
realised it was a satire. But anyway, many years later, and especially after re-watching his entire filmography, I now consider most of Kubrick's movies to be pretty hilarious. And this is no more the case than with Doctor Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, which nowadays I can safely call one of the smartest comedies ever made. And the funny thing is, Red Alert, the book which the film was adapted from, isn't even a comedy, which I think is hilarious and says a lot about the humour of Doctor Strangelove. The fact that nuclear war is already such a joke, such fertile soil to just completely take the piss out of, that all Kubrick really needed to do was to find a serious novel about the subject, adapt it to the screen, you know, maybe exaggerate a few things here and there, get Peter Sellers to play three different characters, employ your, at this point, masterful use of framing and lighting and camera movement, and bang, you've got an absurdist satirical masterpiece on your hands, which is just as relevant 60 years after it was made. Even the behind the scenes stories are priceless, like the way Kubrick led Slim Pickens and the rest of the actors in the plane to believe that they were acting in a serious war drama, or the way that Kubrick talked George C. Scott into doing these absurd, animated, over-the-top practice takes as a warm-up, before of course using these takes in the actual final cut of the movie. Which, you know, is probably a bit morally questionable, I'm not sure if you could get away with that these days, but it did give us, honestly, one of my favourite comedic performances of all time. The man's facial expressions are just hilarious. Like, there's this one moment about halfway through the film, where the American president is on the phone to the leader of the Soviet Union, and it's this really silly, farcical conversation about how the USSR is about to get bombed, and how the world's gonna end and everything, and the camera just keeps cutting to Scott, who just has the most ridiculous look of worry on his face, every now and then looking up to the war room map, like one might glance at. <laughs> a particularly tense game of basketball or something. Overall, I think Dr. Strangelove really exemplifies that Ludwig Wittgenstein quote about how a serious and good philosophical work could be written consisting entirely of jokes. Because yes, while the film is funny and incredibly silly, it does also act as a pretty brilliant manifesto as to why war is stupid. You know, it's kind of the reverse of Paths of Glory in that way. The two films containing basically the same message, but presenting them in such contrasting ways. It is just once again a testament to Kubrick's ridiculous range. Okay, I feel like I've been saying this a lot in this video, but Eyes Wide Shut really is one of Kubrick's most interesting and intriguing movies. Yes, because it was the last film he ever made. I believe he submitted the final cut six days before his death. Yes, because it's Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman and they were married at the time. And yes, because it apparently holds the Guinness World Record for the longest ever continuous movie shoot. 400 days in a row, in case you're interested. But it's mainly just because Eyes Wide Shut is one of those fascinating films which really seems to split and polarise audiences. Like, let's be honest, I don't think many people are going to claim that Full Metal Jacket is the best film Stanley Kubrick ever made, but no one's going to say it's his worst either, are they? Of course not. Pretty much everyone is going to put Full Metal Jacket somewhere in the middle of their Kubrick ranking, just like I've done. However, this just isn't the case with Eyes Wide Shut. It's the type of movie which many people are probably going to have kind of low on their list. You know, it did receive pretty mixed reviews when it first came out. But it's also a film I've seen quite a lot of people have at number one. There are people out there who hail it as a full-blown masterpiece. The best thing Kubrick ever did. IndieWire even put out a top 100 films of the 90s list a while back, which crowned it as the single best film of its decade. And perhaps the most interesting person who believed this to be Kubrick's best film, was Stanley Kubrick himself. And yeah, he might have been suffering from recency bias, it can happen to the best of us, but still, I don't feel like that's something we can just ignore. And look, I'll be honest with you, I also considered putting Eyes Wide Shut at number one in this ranking. In fact, if we're being real with each other here, <laughs> the ordering of these final four films switched around so much while writing this video that I'm pretty sure they were all in the first slot at one point or another. But eventually you just have to make a decision with these things, and based on how I feel at this current moment, Eyes Wide Shut is going to have to settle for fourth place. Because yes, while I am definitely in the masterpiece camp with this one, I mean, honestly, this film is just something else. I can't claim to have 
figured it out yet. Like sure, most of Kubrick's movies are incredibly dense. You know, it's all about the subtext and the symbolism. Often what is not shown and not said is just as important as everything that is shown and is said. It's why Stanley is probably the best to ever do it. It's all just a byproduct of the man's obsessive attention to detail. But honestly, I feel like Eyes Wide Shut is a step up even from the rest of Kubrick's brilliantly cryptic filmography. It's almost like he knew this was his last film and just thought, Man, I'm gonna make something so weird and ambiguous and impenetrable. It's gonna make The Shining, or A Clockwork Orange, or even 2001 A Space Odyssey, a film about the origin of humanity and the meaning of life. It's gonna make them all look like Sesame Street in comparison. I think this is why when preparing for this video, Eyes Wide Shut was the only film I had to re-watch twice, just to know for sure how I felt about it. And clearly I'm still not entirely sure. I don't know if I ever will be, but let me just try and talk about this movie with some semblance of clarity and detail for the sake of this video. So Eyes Wide Shut is adapted from the 1926 German novella Dream Story, which delves into the psychological and sexual journey of a Viennese doctor, who embarks on a nocturnal odyssey after his wife describes a sexual fantasy she once had. The story explores the blurred boundaries between dreams and reality, while exposing the hidden desires and vulnerabilities of its characters. Apparently Kubrick had wanted to adapt the book since he finished 2001 back in 1960. 68, yet only got around to actually begin making the thing in the mid-90s. Whereupon he updated the setting of the novella from early 20th century Vienna to late 20th century New York City, allowing Kubrick to infuse the narrative with a sense of modernity, reflecting his keen interest in exploring more contemporary societal dynamics. And I love how New York City looks in this film, which is funny when you consider that other than a few establishing shots, the entire movie was actually shot on a set in England. But you know what? I think this actually works in the movie's favour, as it makes Bill's Odyssey feel so surreal and dreamlike. I'm sure you've seen that picture of Tom Cruise walking on a treadmill with the projection behind him, and yeah, it's kind of ridiculous, but I don't know what to say. It all just contributes to the film's fictitious, fabricated vibe. I mean, in general, when it comes to this movie's technical aspects, you can really tell that this was the final film Kubrick ever made, that this was Kubrick at his most wise and experienced. I mean, he has just never felt as confident behind a camera as this. And yeah, I know there's some debate online over whether the final edit of Eyes Wide Shut was changed after the man's death, but from the research I've done, and from actually watching the film multiple times, I personally don't think that it's the case. Every shot and cut and needle drop is just note perfect. In terms of what on earth Eyes Wide Shut is about and what it's trying to say, as I've already admitted, I'm not entirely sure. There's definitely a huge discussion about sex going on throughout this film, especially in relation to the ugly side of humanity, how the actual act itself can often feel rather icy and off-putting, and that the true appeal of sex is found in the temptation and pursuit leading up to it. It's the promise and potential for intimacy. It's the lost glances and vivid fantasies, whether they're dreams or nightmares, authentic or inauthentic. <laughs> Watching this seemingly calm and collected doctor's sudden urge to get the one up on his wife after she shamelessly admits to having a sexual fantasy about another man is as dark and depraved as it is hilarious and kind of pitiful. The rabbit hole Bill sends himself down, from nearly getting HIV from a prostitute, to buying a costume from a shop owner who ends up pimping out his own underaged daughter, to finding himself way over his head in some utterly ridiculous sex mansion of the ultra-ruling class who may or may not be killing its attendees who step out of line. There is a lot being said here on class and gender and jealousy and dreams and sex and society's view on sex and existentialism and I could go on and on. It is all very complex and weird and funnily enough, tremendously unsexy which I think, in the end, is the point of the whole thing. Overall, Eyes Wide Shut is definitely Kubrick's most inaccessible film. Like, if I was planning to teach a course on the man's filmography, it would for sure be the final movie discussed. This is the Kubrick master's degree, if you will. However, it is not only one of his most technically proficient movies, but one of the richest and densest pieces of work I think I've ever seen. I am sure that upon every rewatch of this thing, I will get just a tiny bit closer to solving its mysteries, and on top of all of this, 
Eyes Wide Shut joins the apartment and before sunset as having one of the best final lines in all of cinema. Definitely the uh, best mic drop of any directorial career. Okay, let's just address the elephant in the room. Barry Lyndon is one of the most beautiful looking films ever made. You know that phrase, every frame a painting? It's the name of a pretty great YouTube channel. It's also a line in Stanley Kubrick's epic rap battles of history verse. Well, if there's one movie in the universe which deserves the claim of every frame being a painting, it's Barry Lyndon. With the film's aesthetic, by Kubrick's own admission, owing a significant debt to the 18th century English painter William Hogarth, who was celebrated for his gorgeous yet satirical depictions of contemporary society. And clearly this decision worked wonders for this film's visual language. I mean, just look at the shot I'm showing you here. They really are like living, breathing paintings, meticulously arranged compositions reflecting the elegance of 18th century European aristocracy. The use of natural light mirroring the warm tones and soft contrasts found in Hogarth's paintings, in particular the brilliantly intimate candlelit scenes, which Kubrick shot using special lenses developed by NASA, which, okay, while probably not helping with those moon landing conspiracy theories, showcases the man once again pushing the cinema medium to places it had never gone before. And of course, I have to give a special shout out to this shot in particular, which just kind of leaves me speechless every time I watch Barry Lyndon. It's not only my favourite frame from any of Kubrick's movies, but probably my favourite frame from any movie ever. I don't know, it's between this and that one shot from Once Upon a Time in America. Anyway, Barry Lyndon is such a beautiful film that I almost want to say you could watch it on mute, and just let all the stunning cinematography wash over your eyeballs. But that would be doing a huge disservice to this movie's equally breathtaking and often underappreciated story, characters, music, and just about everything else which makes up a film. Because on the surface, Barry Lyndon doesn't seem like the kind of movie which I, or any other people people my age are going to enjoy. Like, sure, people of any background can appreciate some nice looking cinematography, but at the end of the day, no matter the legendary track record of the director, three hour period pieces are daunting. And it's kind of impossible when you first sit down to watch this thing to expect anything other than this really slow, boring piece of work about you know, love and rich people. I mean, look, I don't want to speak for other people or anything, but this was certainly my feeling right before I first watched Barry Lyndon in, I don't know, early 2019, I think. However, it didn't take me long to fall in love with this film, as I soon discovered that the link between Barry Lyndon and Hogarth's art extended beyond mere aesthetic homage. See, Hogarth's paintings, while of course easy on the eyes, would also often serve as social critiques, exposing the hypocrisies and moral ambiguities of his time. And with Barry Lyndon, Kubrick is basically doing the exact same thing. Yes, the film offers up some of the most stunning cinematography you're ever going to see, but it almost feels like the camera, with help from Kubrick's trademark humorously cynical tone, is seeing right through it all, you know? It's transcending the superficiality of this ridiculously pompous, aristocratic world, which existed only a few hundred years ago, delving into the intricate relationships and moral dilemmas faced by the characters in a way you rarely get to see in movies which look like this, in a way which is both hilarious and heartbreaking. Because look, most 18th century period pieces you're going to see are either going to take themselves pretty seriously, or they're going to be some sort of parody. I feel like it's just the natural dichotomy when dealing with a genre and setting which is so specific, you know, with the costumes and the wigs and the cards and the palaces and the Baroque music. But with Kubrick at the helm, he once again is able to achieve that strange middle ground which I was talking about with Dr. Strangelove. You're never really sure if you should be taking the film and the story seriously or not, mostly because you can't nail down the director's true intention. Like, sure. Barry Lyndon is definitely trying to be a sincere drama. For example, it's famous for its historical accuracy, and it also contains some of the most emotional moments in any of Kubrick's films. You know, I've seen people on the internet say they straight up cried at certain scenes in this movie. One of my personal favourite sequences in the film is about 50 minutes in, when Barry is masquerading as a British lieutenant and has a brief affair with a German peasant. That's not me being rude or classist, by the way, it's just 
what she would have been called. But anyway, it's this really tender break in the film, you know, it really tugs on the heartstrings and it's played completely seriously. But at the same time, Kubrick is definitely aware of how ridiculous the world which he's presenting to us is. In fact, this is pretty much the source of all the film's humour. It's basically a three hour laugh at the absurdity of nobility, when viewed from a modern perspective. But it's interestingly only able to achieve this because it is played so straight, because it is so accurate to the time. It's kind of hard to explain if you haven't seen it, like many of Kubrick's films, but there's just this subtle irony and touch of absurdity to everything. For example, the formation of the soldiers in this battle scene just slowly marching to their death, I guess prioritising pageantry and decorum over actual battle strategy. Or the scene where Barry is mugged, which feels like it was pulled straight out of Monty Python's Flying Circus. The Captain Feeney. None other. May I introduce you to my son, Seamus. How do you do? And that's just the first hour. Once we enter the second act of this film and get into more of the quote unquote high society stuff, the pure ridiculousness of it all steps up yet another level, to the point where everyone in the film sort of looks and acts like a cartoon character. He wants to step into my shoes. He, he wants to step into my shoes! Do you see what I mean? This complex interplay between drama and satire is definitely something Kubrick employed in many of his films, but I can't imagine how much fun the man had with this specific time period. And this nuanced approach allows the film to exist in a space that is neither entirely serious nor outright parody, inviting the audience to appreciate the authenticity of the narrative while also recognising the idiosyncrasies and eccentricities of the time period. It really is a unique tone which I think was greatly influential in the genre, especially when looking at movies such as Amadeus or more recently The Favourite. Barry Lyndon is overall an incredible piece of work. In fact, it actually feels really weird only putting it at number three on this list, because for a long time I considered this to be not only my favourite Kubrick movie, but one of my favourite films of all time. Like, for example, you know how Sight and Sound every decade do that huge poll where they ask a ton of directors and critics what they think the 10 best movies ever made are? Well, throughout the years, whenever I've thought about which films I would submit for the poll, if I was ever lucky enough to be asked, Barry Lyndon was usually on my list. So why have I only put it at number three this time round. Well, if we're being honest with each other, I just feel like the final two films on this list are doing a bit more with the cinematic medium. You know, they're a bit more ambitious and stylish than Barry Lyndon, leaning more into Kubrick's more surreal tendencies, which is just going to hit me more on a gut level. But that takes absolutely nothing away from Barry Lyndon. It really is one of the most beautiful films ever made, and a uh, fun time for the whole family. And before we move on, let me just give a quick shout out to Ryan Ryan O'Neill, who in my opinion gives a really good performance here and who passed away recently on the 8th of December. Actually only a few hours after I finished this most recent rewatch of Barry Lyndon, which definitely felt spooky when I got that notification on my phone, but I guess the stars just aligned that day. Oh, and uh, speaking of stars. <sighs> okay guys, it's time to admit something I'm pretty embarrassed about. I have never seen 2001 A Space Odyssey on the big screen. You need to be. Now this usually wouldn't be an issue for me, I'm not one of those people who think you need to watch every film in a cinema to truly appreciate them, but when it comes to something with the legendary size and ambition of 2001, yeah, it kind of feels weird watching it on the television, I'll be honest. I think it therefore says quite a lot about this film, that despite the small screen, despite the monkeys and the star child not feeling as grand as they probably should, despite Richard Strauss's Usso Sprack Zarathustra not thundering from all four corners of my room as Kubrick probably intended it to, 2001 is still able to hypnotise me so easily. And I believe the reason behind this really speaks to why this film is so revered 
why myself and so many others keep coming back to it. 2001 is not really trying to tell a story, at least not in the way that most movies are. I've already mentioned how pretty much all of Kubrick's films are heavy in subtext. You know, the man made incredibly dense movies which rarely tell us what to feel or think, instead essentially vaulting over the part of our brain which usually absorbs stories, and landing into a more subconscious, cerebral area. And while I stand by the opinion that Eyes Wide Shut is the most ambiguous of Kubrick's films, I do just think whatever on earth that movie is trying to communicate is even more enigmatic than 2001's cosmic, psychedelic existentialism. What it does not have is a 15 minute sequence of men dressed as monkeys hitting each other with bones, nor does it contain anything close to the Stargate sequence, which has got to be one of the most widely distributed pieces of avant-garde art ever, just like this utterly insane experimental short film, which Kubrick snuck in to the end of the movie. It's kind of like the Revolution 9 of film scenes. So yeah, while I have never seen this film on the big screen, and while that's definitely an experience I would love to have one day, it almost doesn't really matter because when it comes to something like 2001 A Space Odyssey, the film is occurring between your eyes just as much as it's occurring in front of them. You know, not to get all Terence McKenna about it, but it's kind of closer to telepathy than your typical movie which is basically saying, this happened, then this happened, and this is how you should feel about it. 2001 isn't exactly a film one can really talk about properly. It's working on such a cerebral level that words kind of fail to do it justice. I've seen so many reviews about this which are basically along the lines of, yeah, I have no idea what to say about this movie, you kind of just have to watch it. And yeah, to be honest, I feel the same way. However, it would be lazy to just leave it at that and move on to the final film in this list. So here's what I'm gonna do for you. First of all, I'm going to leave a link in the description of this video on a 3000 word essay I wrote about this film in 2021 while studying at university. It focuses mainly on 2001's allegorical nature in relation to Frederick Nietzsche's book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. The essay leans far more heavily into philosophy than filmmaking, but yeah, if you wanted to hear some of my thoughts on what it all means, written in a more academic style, then by all means go to the description and read to your heart's content. But the second thing I'll do right now is to just go through the three chapters of this movie, you know, discuss my thoughts on each of them, before attempting to wrap it all up in the end with some semblance of finality and resolution. How does that sound? Okay, great. So, the dawn of man is kind of crazy. After an utterly ominous overture, we get that iconic intro. And just like, imagine being someone in the cinema in 1968, and you're seeing these planets align, and the music is blaring into your eardrums, and then the film just cuts to this title card. You'd be like, Oh, this film is ambitious, ambitious. Here we get some breathtaking shots of the Namibian plains, followed by the ape sequence. So one thing I've always wondered is how on earth they filmed the bit where a leopard literally attacks one of the apes? Like, is that just real? And after some research, yeah, turns out it's real. This poor guy in an ape suit just had to let himself be mauled by a leopard for like 10 seconds. Anyway, this first 15 minutes is you know, it's patient stuff. We get these two ape tribes fighting over a water spot, and I kinda like it, to be honest, especially once the monolith arrives. As for my theory on the monolith itself, I reckon it's probably something to do with God, or aliens, or both, but I'd make the claim that you're not really supposed to know. I definitely don't think Kubrick knew. Like, sure. That essay I wrote offers an interpretation of what 2001 is really about, but it's not like there's one correct answer to everything that occurs during this film. Stanley himself said it best when responding to all the unanswered questions 2001 leaves us with, quote, how could we possibly appreciate the Mona Lisa if Leonardo had written at the bottom of the canvas, the lady is smiling because she is hiding a secret from her lover? This would shackle the viewer to reality, and I don't want this to happen to 2001. End quote. And yeah, I know the book explains what it all means, but that doesn't count, man. It came out after the film, and plus, it's always better when you don't explain the magic. See The Phantom Menace or The Legend of Korra, or basically every single prequel or sequel ever made for more proof of this. The monolith is a monolith. It's supposed to represent what man cannot understand. Anyway, eventually the monolith in all its divine power is somehow able to imbue one of the ape tribes with a higher intelligence and the ability to recognize and utilize tools. I like how it turns out the first tool our species ever made was a weapon 
weapon used to bludgeon an enemy. Just classic humanity. And yeah, that cut from the bone to the satellite is incredible. But what I love just as much with the following sequence in space is that there is no new title card. This is still just the dawn of man. I guess because when viewing the universe from a slightly more ubiquitous existential perspective, these things are both just tools, you know? In the grand scheme of things, 2.6 million years isn't that big of a time jump. The next 35 minutes are dedicated to showing us the era of space exploration. And I feel like it's this entire sequence which is responsible for most people's claims that 2001 is slow, and if we're being honest, I wouldn't entirely disagree. Don't get me wrong, there's lots of stuff here I adore. This shot of the pen floating into frame is definitely one of my favourite shots in any of Kubrick's movies. I love this moment detailing a ridiculously long list of space toilet instructions. 2001 is definitely one of Kubrick's least funny films, but it's nice to know his humour is still here in small ways. And the thing is beautiful just to watch, you know, I'm always so in awe whenever I watch this or the original Star Wars trilogy or Blade Runner at just how well the practical effects hold up. It is really just a perfect demonstration why our effects should be as practical as possible. Because to me this kind of thing is just timeless and looks infinitely better than anything a computer could come up with. Which is kind of funny when you think about the themes of this movie. But yeah, this sequence is kind of slow, and I don't think Kubrick would deny that. It's kind of just the point. It's supposed to be introducing us to this new cosmic period of humanity, where we are once again children, learning to walk, eat, and drive. I feel like this section is probably a little less impressive than it would have been in 1968, just because since then we have not only seen so many other fictional depictions of space exploration on screen, but also just in the real world. Technology has advanced so much since 2001 A Space Odyssey came out. I mean, people watching this film back in 1968 had never seen a man walk on the moon before, and now we can watch 4K footage of Mars from YouTube. So yeah, it's probably the weakest part of the film, but I understand what it's doing and the movie wouldn't be the same without it, so fine. But let's be real with each other here. It's the final 80 minutes of 2001 where the film really becomes the jaw-dropping masterpiece that everyone still speaks about 56 years later. First we have the Jupiter mission, with my boys Dave and Frank and HAL 9000 and those three scientists in suspended animation, can't wait to see them wake up. Also, am I the only one who thinks Dave looks exactly like Jeff Winger from Community? Like, to the point where it's a bit weird? Anyway, this is definitely some of the best filmmaking you're ever going to see. First we get the introduction to the crew and their general routine, but immediately the atmosphere feels off. There's this dark lingering suspense which never really leaves the film actually. The beautiful classical music we've heard throughout the movie suddenly turns sinister almost like it's been spoiled. And then of course there's HAL 9000, who is one of the best villains in the history of cinema for a myriad of reasons, but I think it's mainly just his voice. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. Douglas Rain absolutely nails the inflections of a computer who has been programmed to sound somewhat like a human. It's especially interesting to listen to in a time where AI voices are becoming such a normality. And of course, this brewing tension within the ship comes to a head when HAL 9000 decides that the mission is too important to leave in the hands of mere humans, and goes on a murderous rampage. I love Kubrick's use of silence here, especially in the moment HAL kills Frank and we see him just writhing around in space. Really creepy stuff, which then, speaking of creepiness, leads to Dave's quest to shut down Hal. Spine-tingling stuff this, not only because it contains some of the best cinematography of all time, but Hal achingly singing Daisy Daisy Give Me Your Answer Do is actually a lot more touching than I initially remembered, weirdly enough, but also kind of foreboding when you consider what happens next. Like I've already mentioned, the entire Stargate scene is definitely one of the most bizarre sequences to have ever been put into a commercial film. But I mean that purely as a compliment, and while I think its hypnotic quality drops slightly once Kubrick switches from Douglas Trumbull's utterly entrancing slit-scan psychedelia to, you know, shots of landscapes with the colour adjusted, which is something these days you could pull off on Windows Movie Maker, it is still jaw-dropping to watch, and I can't even imagine what people must have felt like seeing it for the first time in 1968. It's filmmaking on a truly subconscious, cerebral, gut level, 
and it's just glorious. The final 10 minutes of 2001 A Space Odyssey is easily one of the best endings to any film ever. Once again, no I'm not going to try and break it down in this video and try to explain what everything means. If you want something like that, you can go read the essay I wrote in the description. But like I've already said, I think it's missing the point of the movie to try and break it down. This bedroom lives just as much in my head absolutely rent free as the dormitory in Full Metal Jacket. I love how it's deliberately not consistent to any one time period. I mean, there's definitely French architecture going on here, but also the floor is glowing. I guess the idea is that this room is supposed to be like a human zoo, and that these aliens or gods or both have attempted to recreate our natural habitat, and I'd say they did a decent job of it, I guess. Anyway, then of course Dave turns old and transforms into a space baby, who then teleports to Earth and punishes me for not having ever seen this absolute masterpiece on the big screen. And that's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Hot take, this is a pretty good film, but wow I was talking for a long time there. So please Stanley, just give me something simple and easy and family friendly to finish this video off with. Thank you. Oh dear. <laughs> so I haven't mentioned this before, but I'm not really a huge fan of horror, which to be honest, I don't think is that big of a deal. It's just not a genre I've ever really connected with. I think fear is one of, if not the most difficult emotion to elicit through art, and to tell you the truth, most horror films I've watched throughout the years have fallen short of evoking any level of terror within me. Which, you know, is not the end of the world or anything. But when it's the sole purpose of that movie, the experience can often end up feeling rather empty. However, I've always loved The Shining. It was my first Kubrick film and one of the first horror films I had ever experienced. And about halfway through this most recent rewatch of The Thing, it suddenly hit me that perhaps this whole time, the real reason behind my indifference to this hugely popular genre is simply due to the fact that no other self-proclaimed horror film I've ever seen has been able to achieve even a quarter of the utter eeriness present in The Shining. I think the best way for me to explain the unique brilliance of The Shining is to first talk about Stephen King's original 1977 novel, which if you somehow didn't know, tells the story of Jack Torrance, a struggling writer and a recovering alcoholic who accepts a position as the off-season caretaker of the iconic Overlook Hotel, and begins to be possessed by some sort of supernatural force, endangering both his wife and five-year-old son, who just so happens to be a psychic. You know, standard stuff. And I love the story of how Kubrick came to adapt King's novel. Basically, after Barry Lyndon, which wasn't exactly the commercial or critical success it deserved to be, Stanley realised that his next movie needed to be one which was, yes, artistically fulfilling, but also something that would make money. According to Vincent Lebrotto's Stanley Kubrick, a biography, the man planted himself in his office, and had his staff bring him stacks upon stacks of horror books to read. Quote, Kubrick's secretary heard the sound of each book hitting the wall, as the director flung it into a reject pile after reading the first few pages. Finally, one day the secretary noticed it had been a while since she had heard the thud of another writer's work biting the dust. She walked in to check on her boss, and found Kubrick deeply engrossed in a copy of The Shining. End quote. A few years later, Stanley Kubrick's new self-proclaimed masterpiece of modern horror hit theatres, and people didn't really like it. Most of all, Stephen King, who famously hated the film, claiming that it misunderstood at a very fundamental level what his book was about. See, in the Shining novel, Jack Torrance actually starts off as a somewhat normal bloke. Like, yeah, sure, he's recovering from alcoholism, which was inspired by King's own struggles, but overall he is a pretty ordinary man who little by little descends into madness over the course of the entire story. Kubrick, however, much to King's dismay, cast Jack Nichols in the main role, who is one of the best actors of all time, but let's just say he doesn't exactly give off ordinary man vibes. Nor did Kubrick ever intend his version of Jack Torrance to come across at any point as your standard bloke. Like, don't get me wrong, there is definitely an arc which goes on here, the man at the start of the movie is not the same as the man at the end, but there is never a point in this film where you feel sympathy for Jack Torrance, where you think he might not attempt to kill his family with an axe. It's a complete deviation from King's original novel, in story and in tone and in character, 
And I 100% understand why King was so frustrated with this, because it is not a good adaptation of his work. However, <laughs> it works. And it really shouldn't, by the way, it doesn't make sense, but I think this hits at the heart of why The Shining is one of the best films ever made. Because sure, most directors approaching this story are going to cast an everyman to play Jack Torrance, just as King had envisioned, and they're gonna have him undergo this tragic descent into madness, fueled by the supernatural forces of the Overlook Hotel, until he ultimately succumbs to his violent and destructive impulses. And you know what? it probably would have been a decent horror movie. I can see someone like James Wan or Andy Machete really giving this story a good go. But Stanley Kubrick, in all his genius, decided to do something just completely different. From the first few seconds of The Shining, where we see that car drive through the Rocky Mountains and hear that iconic music, something feels incredibly off. And it's not something one could really describe in words. It's kind of like the feeling elicited by 2001 A Space Odyssey's Jupiter mission, but on acid. <laughs> Nothing feels right about this movie. Yeah, it's about a haunted hotel, but it's more than that. It's like the film is itself haunted. The architecture of the Overlook Hotel doesn't make any sense. There are windows and corridors which literally should not be there. It's a film which not only disobeys its source material, but a film which disobeys itself. Nicholson's portrayal of Jack Torrance isn't some gradual descent into madness, it's a plunge from the very beginning. Watching it feels like Nicholson's walked off the set of a black comedy, but it's not like we see the film through his eyes. In fact, we don't see The Shining through any of the characters' perspectives. Instead, Kubrick offers us us one lonesome steadicam, always in motion, usually low to the floor. It's almost like we're watching these events take place through the eyes of some omniscient ghost wandering the Overlook Hotel. And this combined with one of the best, most wild, droning, avant-garde and ridiculously underrated soundtracks ever put to film, is able to build such an eerie, unsettling, frightening momentum. The Shining is one of those perfectly paced films. It is constantly rising. It's like the cinematic equivalent of one long crescendo on a single, out-of-tune violin string. Let's talk about the performances, one by one, because The Shining hands down contains the best acting in any of Kubrick's movies. Jack Nicholson is Jack Nicholson. I've already touched on him a bit, so I won't go too in depth here, but he's just so equally frightening and hilarious. Wendy? I'm home. I understand why people thought he was terrible when the film first came out. He is definitely doing something very strange and out there, but this is one of those performances, and movies in general, which clearly just needed to sit in the public consciousness for a few years. Once you sort of understand what Nicholson is going for here, it just works. It's so congruent to what the rest of the movie is trying to do, and I don't think if Stephen King had gotten his way and Jack Torrance was played by an everyman, the film would have worked half as well. Danny Lloyd, who plays Danny Torrance, mate, everyone in this movie has the same name as the characters they play. Anyway, Danny Lloyd gives what I think is a top three child performance of all time, and it's kind of crazy that the kid didn't even know he was acting in a horror film, instead believing it to be some sort of family drama, because he is honestly just so compelling here. There are a lot of scenes in this movie which are just him acting by himself, and you never even think for a second that he's just some six-year-old kid who had never even been in anything before The Shining, and who was never in anything afterwards. I mean, seriously, Danny Lloyd, if we're going off consistency, he is one of the best actors of all time. He was in one film, that film was a masterpiece, and he was perfect in it. No wonder he retired afterwards. And then of course there's Shelley Duval, who, this might be a controversial opinion, but I think she gives not only the single best performance in the entirety of Kubrick's filmography, but honestly, one of the best performances I have ever seen. There is always a discussion in horror movies over how scary the characters or monsters are, but I think what is just as important is how convincingly frightened everyone else is. And while The Shining would not work without Jack Nicholson, I believe Shelley Duval, who here gives such an incredible performance of just utter terror, is even more integral to The Shining's success. She is the heart of the film, so to speak. 
and I think we should address the elephant in the room which always surrounds this performance. I will try and make this as quick as possible while acknowledging that the situation does need to be respected. So whenever The Shining is mentioned these days, especially on the internet, everyone is very quick to bring up the idea that Stanley Kubrick purposefully abused Shelley Duvall on set, and essentially drove her delirious for the sake of wringing out a more authentic portrayal of fear and madness. And I'll just come out and say it, I don't think it's true. This is purely from the research I have done, obviously I was not on the set of The Shining, but what I do know is, one, stories on the internet, especially ones like this, are often exaggerated over time by people without any sources cited, kind of like a game of digital Chinese whispers. And two, last year I went to see The Shining at the BFI in London, amazing experience, and it was presented by Toy Story 3 director Lee Unkrich, who was there advertising his then new 2500 hundred dollar book about the movie. Before the screening he spoke about his research for the book, how he basically interviewed as many people who worked on the film as possible, including Shelley Duval, and eventually came to the conclusion that this whole scandal is a bit of an urban myth, similar to those stories that Heath Ledger lived in a cave for a year to prepare for the Joker. It's just not really true. To quote Lee Unkrich himself, The story of Shelley Duvall and her supposed mistreatment on the set has become more and more exaggerated over the years, to the point where that's all discussed as if it was this extremely abusive situation, which it just wasn't. And I'm very careful in talking about that subject, to let Shelley have the last word because she's the one who experienced it. Shelley has nothing but great things to say about Stanley. She loved him. She thinks he got a great performance out of her. She didn't always agree with his methods. She will admit it was an extremely difficult part to play, but these stories of abuse, which are bad for lots of people involved, are just completely unfair." End quote. Here's the thing, Stanley Kubrick was an intense director. He famously pushed everyone to their limits and would often demand over 100 takes for a single scene. I'm sure he was very difficult to work with. I'm sure his shoots were exhausting and emotionally draining, and I'm sure this took a toll on Shelley Duvall, like it did with many of the actors Kubrick worked with. But to speak for her, to overwrite what she has said on the matter just because you saw some story on Reddit, to accuse Stanley Kubrick of abusing, bullying, and exploiting an actress just to get a better performance out of her, to claim Shelley Duvall lost her mind during the shooting of The Shining and quit acting because of it when it was like in the first third of her acting career, it's all just a bit silly, I think. Why don't we just listen to what Shelley Duvall herself has said about the whole thing? Like surely she is the most reputable source about her own life and experiences. But anyway, I'm gonna leave it there with Shelley Duvall. She does give one of my favourite performances of all time in one of my favourite films of all time. The Shining truly is a rare piece of work. It's the type of movie you hear so much about. I mean, there's an entire separate documentary just about the theories surrounding this film. It's so iconic and revered, and then you watch it and you completely understand why. It is genuinely one of the most unique, dense, and frightening things ever made and in my opinion, it's the best film Stanley Kubrick ever did. And that's gonna be it for this video. <sighs> what an adventure, what an odyssey, if you will. <laughs> Thank you for making it to the end of this video, please let me know your own Kubrick rankings in the comment section, I'm very interested to see what you have to say, and also let me know what other directors you'd like to see me do. I'm thinking maybe Yorgos Lanthimos or Miyazaki, as they both have films out at the moment, but yeah. Once again, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.